remember my big 5-0. I had a very difficult time with it uh, for months before that birthday. And I asked people about it and they said, yeah, well, you know, it's very hard and then on that day it breaks. It was difficult for me because I remember very clearly you have to accept the fact at that birthday that your youth is irrevocably over. Um, I remember thinking, I'm not old yet, but I'm not young anymore either. And then uh, I had the experience, which people told me I would have, which is that on that day something broke. And with everything in life, whether it's our own bodies, our own lives, or anything else, we must say farewell to that which is no longer. We must be willing to lay down that which is no longer in order to accept that which is now. And we never have to worry about doing that. We never have to worry that the beauties and the gifts and the treasures of yesterday will not remain with us. Because the beauties and the gifts and the treasures of yesterday are spiritual in nature. They are spiritual in nature. And so they remain with us in the very cell and the very core of our being. I think that also relates to our country. It certainly relates to the human species. You know, the human species is filled with hearts that beat with gold, the gold of love and decency and compassion. The very, very largest, obviously, majority of people on this planet simply love. They just want to live decent lives. They want to raise their children. They want their children to be okay. And they want to leave the world a little bit better to their kids, have a future, have a life. There's love in so many people's hearts on this planet. There are billions of people on this planet, and hearts are filled with love. So how come hatred has us hostage on this earth? I'll tell you why hatred has us hostage on this earth. Hatred has us hostage, even though so many fewer people on this planet hate than love. The problem we have on this planet is that those who hate, hate with conviction. And conviction is the force multiplier. And so it's not enough to have a fantastic place like this. We have to claim it. It's not enough to have the freedom to even be in a place like this. You know, we talk about America's problems. God knows we have America uh, problems in America, but sometimes it's very important whether you're looking at your own shadow or the shadows of your country. Remember, you didn't do everything wrong. Remember, sometimes people say, we well, got to really own your darkness. Yeah, you got to own your light in life, too. And so let's not only take a moment to realize how extraordinary that we can be in this building, but let's also remember such things as here in the United States of America, because we have freedom of religion, so we, you know, it's like a, it's written on a piece of paper, freedom of religion, it's a constitutional right. But you know, it's not just the letter of the law, it's also the spirit of the law. It means that no policeman can come in here and say, break it up, you're not on the official list. You're too outside the box, you're too weird, this metaphysical stuff, it's not on the official list, you've got to break it up. No one is going to do that. So, you know, in Judaism it says that every generation must rediscover God for itself. And every generation of Americans have to rediscover that which is great. And every generation on this planet has to rediscover and claim that which is great. Because the only thing that will, in the end, prevail over hatred, having now been turned into a political force, which we call terrorism, the only thing that will prevail over hatred, having been turned into a political and social force, is for love to be turned into a political and social force. You know, the reason we don't have a monarchy in the United States is because we were born of the notion that each and every man, woman, and child has that inner light. Somebody was, we were looking the other day over on 60-something street, there's actually a replica of the, of the um, uh, Statue of Liberty, and of course, here, we're in New York, you have the real Statue of Liberty. And somebody was talking about the diadem. Somebody was talking about the diadem around her head. What does that mean? What it means is enlightenment. It's what the original crowns came from of kings and queens, that there's light around our head, and that is enlightenment. But that is the light of God in human form. So it's time, you know, when I look at the world, I don't see more hatred than love. I just see hatred backed by so much money. I see hatred backed by so much technology. I see hatred backed by so many governments. I see hatred backed by so many arms and armaments. It's time for us to claim and for, to use and to pick up the power. They are mainly internal powers. Martin Luther King said, we have a power in us which is greater than the power of bullets. And it's time for us to claim our power, ladies and gentlemen. It is time for us to say goodbye to what was. You know, yesterday in the Jewish religion was Yom Kippur, one of the very, very holiest days of the year. It is the day of repentance. 
And it is the end of 10 days called the days of awe. And those are the days when in the Jewish religion, people are to look deep inside ourselves and to reconcile and to atone and to repent. And then at the end of the Yom Kippur service, once it is sundown on Yom Kippur, and yesterday, this year, because it was a Yom Kippur on the Sabbath, it was even holier than most. And then at the end, when it's sundown, they blow the shofar. And you know, when they blow the shofar, and you, it is the shift in the molecular structure of the room because God says, I have heard your repentance. I have heard your atonement. I grant you one more year in the book of life. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, God does his part if we do ours. And when we reconcile, whether it's Ramadan or Yom Kippur or Easter or Christmas, all of these great spiritual vibrations, you know, there's only one truth spoken in many different ways, spoke with the truth with a capital T. And all the great religious and spiritual traditions are doors into the same room, steps up to the same mountaintop. And that's why you don't have to be Muslim for Ramadan to have an effect on you. You don't have to be Jewish for the days of awe to have an effect on you. You don't have to be Christian for Easter and Christmas to have an effect on you. And there is a veritable spiritual explosion on the earth today. And it is about time because darkness is doing its thing as well. But you know what? This is what's the thing with darkness, whether it's in our own individual lives or in our country or in our planet. Darkness does not hesitate to claim its power. And darkness does not hesitate to claim your life. And darkness does not hesitate to claim your country. And darkness does not hesitate to claim your planet. Darkness does not hesitate to claim its power over you when it comes, let's say, in the form of addiction. Darkness does not claim, uh, hesitate to claim its power over you in any psychological issue, neurosis, or pathology that you have. Darkness does not hesitate to claim your family when it's an addictive issue that has now claimed your entire family system. Darkness does not hesitate to claim this country in the form of economic injustice, the highest mass incarceration rate in the world, the second highest child poverty rate in the advanced world and the, the, a, a permanent war machine that has now become norm so that we have young children growing up. They don't know that there used to be a time when you were in a war and then you were out of the war because they haven't even been alive when we were out of a war. No, darkness is proactive and darkness knows what it wants and darkness claims, claims a life, darkness claims a country for its own whenever we allow it to. What's the problem there? The power of darkness? Uh-uh, that's not the problem. The problem is that we, human beings, children of God, to infrequently claim the power of the light. We can't complain. We can't really complain when you know you wake up in the morning. You know, most people, you wake up in the morning and you take a shower, you take a bath. You don't want to take yesterday's dirt with you out into the day. But if you wake up in the morning and you don't meditate and you don't pray, you might have washed the dirt off your body, but you haven't washed the stress off your heart and off your mind. First thing you do, you go to the computer, you turn on television, listen to the radio. So not only do you have your own stress left over from yesterday, you have the stress from Somalia and you have the stress from Ebola and you have the stress from Syria and you have the stress from ISIL and then what happens in America today is then you just saunter off out into the day you don't know by noon you're not really aware why it's like mystifying to you why you're depressed so you've not only taken your stress from yesterday you've taken half the world's stress with you and then the only answer that we have to this on a mass level is the pharmaceutical pharmaceuticalization of the United States of America that's the best we can do is to turn our depression to turn our depression into a gold mine for pharmaceutical companies that are already halfway running the country at what point do we stop saying yeah and we start saying no baby no 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 because we claim See, this is the deal. A lot of people say, oh, well, you know, I just have to do it because it's, it, I'm very, it's very sad times in which we live. Yeah, well, let me tell you something about sad times. Lighten them up. This is not a time in America to be numb, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what we should be in places like this for. You know, you come on a Sabbath. A Sabbath is a very, very powerful time. As Tim was saying, this is the day God rested. This is the day you come to a Sabbath service, whatever your religion is. You come to Sabbath to get your battery recharged because the work of God is on Monday through you and on Tuesday through you and on Wednesday through you and on Thursday through you and on Friday through you and on Saturday through you. And then on Sunday or Saturday, if your Sabbath is Saturday, you just take it all in and you let it all, it all comes back, it all comes back. And then you go out into the world and you are the light. 
We are the light. Things aren't going to change if we don't change them. God cannot do for us what he cannot do through us. And for us to look at a place like this and realize what an opportunity we have here, to come here on Sunday and just feel you, you, you all, all that spiritual power cruise onto you. It's like getting your gas tank filled in your car, and you can have all the spiritual power for you all throughout the week. And all these freedoms that we have living in the United States of America. You know, we're not the first. Sometimes I think this generation, somebody said to me not too long ago, well, what should Americans do today? I mean, Americans are just so depressed about everything. Americans are so depressed, you know, the economic injustice, the economic disparity, and the fact that we're always in a war, and the fact that we have this high mass incarceration rate, and we have this, what we're doing to the environment and the child poverty. Americans are just so depressed. What are we supposed to do? My message to this generation of Americans, stop whining. Stop whining. We're not the first generation of Americans who had problems on our hands. We had generations of Americans who lived with slavery. They didn't just whine. They started the abolitionist movement, and then through that in the Civil War, they ended slavery. There were generations in which women didn't have the right to vote. Did they just whine? No, there emerged the, the suffragette movement, much here in New York. And then from that came the 19th Amendment, and women gained the right to vote. We had other generations that had to live with legalized segregation in the American South, institutionalized racism, and, and, and institutionalized segregation. Did they just whine? No. Uh, emerged then the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King, and with the civil rights movement led to the civil rights legislation that ended legalized segregation in the United States. Let this not be the first generation of Americans who wimp out on the job that needs to be done. Uh -uh. And I think we should also point out, it behooves us to, walk, to point out where the abolitionist movement came from and where the women's suffragette movement came from and where the civil rights movement came from. Ladies and gentlemen, they came from spiritual sources. The abolitionist movement emerged from the Quakers. And many of the leaders of the suffragette movement were Quakers. And obviously, the Civil Rights Movement, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, led by a Baptist preacher from Atlanta, Georgia. Excuse me, why was that true? Because those of spirit do not whine. Those of spirit stand in conviction because when you stand in conviction, you know it's not even me doing it. It's this thing in me but not of me that can do for me. That can do for me what I cannot do for myself and which can do for humanity what humanity on its own cannot do and which has done for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And we have a lot of miracles on this planet with which to prove it. You know, the Quakers are a fascinating group. They sit still, like Tim was talking about. They sit still and they discern the inner light. They discern the inner light within every man, woman, and child. And they discern the fact that through that light, we are all equal in God's eyes. So here's this group of people, this very simple group of people, who are sitting in silence. They just sit in silence until they hear the word for God. Word of God speaking through them. So you look at the history of the United States, in particular the history of the abolitionist movement. So here's this group of people just sitting quietly, in silence, hearing the word for God. Now, did God say to them, ignore slavery? It's really toxic, and you're trying to live a positive life. Did they say, no, I hear that these days. You hear that a lot these days, don't you? It's like, I don't want to look at all the terrible things happening because I'm trying to live a positive life. There's nothing positive about complacency, ladies and gentlemen. There's nothing positive about looking away from other people's suffering. And there is no serious spiritual journey that gives any of us a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. No, what the abolitionists heard was do something about it. That's what they heard, do something about it. Help with that Underground Railroad. Do what you can, resist. And so what the spiritual life does is it sits in quiet, and what builds within us in a vertical sense is an absolute conviction that what is correct is correct and we must stand on that. 
And what is incorrect is intolerable. That's what happened within the Quakers, that it came to the point where it was, slavery was simply intolerable. But what the spiritual power gives us that the Quakers had and that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had and that all of us have is not only the conviction that what is wrong should not be here, but that through the grace of God, that which is pure and true and holy and beautiful good is eminently feasible through the grace of God within us. And that is the power. You know, if you look at the Star of David or at the Christian cross, they are both visual symbols for that intersecting point between the axis of the divine and the axis of the earth. And so when a Jew wears a Star of David across their heart or a Christian wears the, wears the cross, and all the great religious systems have their parallel to this, it is one truth shared by all then what that means is that I claim for myself to have my feet on the earth. We want to be people of this earth whose thoughts are the thoughts of heaven. Because when our thoughts are the thoughts of heaven, but we are fully embodied on the earth, then heaven and earth become one in us. And that is what is meant to happen. And in this place, for instance, God has given us a palace. God has given you a power. Look at this place. But we're in such a hurry today, you know, the assault of modernity. It's all coming at us. It's all coming at us. It's created an ADD society. You, you look in your computer, and that which is deeply important is given on your computer screen the same level of, of import as something ultimately meaningless. And you see, we used to have institutions that helped us discern. We used to have institutions. Government was, a, was, was an instrument of this, and the media was an instrument of this. And education, there were pillars in our society which actually enabled the discernment of that which is most important and that which is least important. But unfortunately, and sometimes you just got to face what's going on, we live at a time today where there is money to be made, more money to be made, and more power to be had sometimes by luring people into the zone of that which is not important, distracting people from the zone of that which is important. So at a time like this, what do you got to do? You got to think for yourself. And you got to make sure you're around other people who are thinking for themselves. Because when we are around people, you know, you look at someone like the abolitionists and you look at people like the women suffragettes, what did they have? They had no material power. They had no faxes. They had no cell phones. They had no computers. They had no anything. What they had was what Martin Luther King would call cosmic companionship. You know, the hour is late, ladies and gentlemen. Pick up any newspaper, the hour is late. Whether it's Ebola or ISIL or the state of the environment, let us not pretend the hour is not late. We must be the grown-ups here. For those of us who have children, I know many people in this room have children. One of the things about having a child in the house, you know, it's your turn to be the grown-up. You gotta handle business. And you know, every parent in this room, if you haven't gotten here yet, you probably one day will get there. This place where something could be going on, I don't know, it could be drugs, sex, whatever it is, and this fierce thing arises in you and you say to your child, excuse me, that will not be happening in this house. And you're kind of laughing inside because you really don't know what you'll do if they challenge you at this moment, but the look on your face is such that they're not challenging you, you are so fierce, that will not be happening in this house. Do you hear me? Well, you know what? I think that's the role of the citizen today. We need to be the grown-ups in this house. And when we look at permanent war machines because of a $700 billion defense establishment every year, when we look at the desecration of our environment simply so that oil and gas companies can make money and so forth, when we look at the fact that we have the second highest child poverty rate in this country, when we look at the fact that we have the highest mass incarceration rate in the world, when we look at the fact that one, um, an African-American man in the United States today has a one in three lifetime probability of incarceration. When we look at the fact that something's going on because unarmed black men keep getting shot by the police, it is time for us as citizens of the United States to stand up in fierceness and say, that will not be happening in this house. That will not be happening in this house. <clears throat> so when I look at the abolitionists, 
They were the strongest people in the room. They were the most powerful people in the room. They were the grown-ups in the room. When you look at the women suffragettes, they were the grown-ups in the room. It's time for us to be the grown-ups in the room. And sometimes I meet too many people who are in the name of this kind of weird notion of spirituality allow their spiritual practice to somehow infantilize them. Those of us with a spiritual perspective should be the biggest grown-ups in the room. Because we are able and willing through the grace of God to hold the juxtaposition. The juxtaposition between that which is terribly wrong and that which we know through the grace of God can be made infinitely right. You know, there is a, a level on which if you're looking at the world today and the state of humanity today and you're not grieving, you're not really watching. But on the other hand, if you're not rejoicing in the infinite possibilities, the miraculous possibilities, not only for our own individual life, but for humanity itself and for the planet, then you are not yet seeing with your spiritual eye. You know, on a personal level, that's what we all talk about. That's what we all talk about. You can have anything because you can be anything. It's time for us to take these spiritual principles that we have already feel, felt transform our own individual lives and know that it also applies to a country and it applies to a species. It's not just that through the grace of God you can have anything and you can be anything. It's not just that through the grace of God all your wounds can be healed. It's not just that through the grace of God. Let the rich poor now say I'm rich. Let the weak now say I'm strong. It's not just that in your own individual individual life, God can work miracles. Now it's time for those of us who have a taste of that. Maybe our lives aren't perfect yet, but we have felt God moving on the waters of our own individual lives. We, you know, we, we might not be perfect yet, but we're a whole lot better than we used to be. If you are at that point, then it's time to join the great spiritual revolution of our time. The spiritual revolution of our time whereby we get, God not only has promised us as individuals. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that Judaism and Islam have in common that is different than Christianity, very interesting, is that in both Judaism and Islam, the theology is, is interlaced with the history of the people. And that causes some problems, and it also causes some blessings. So ideationally, it's a fascinating thing to apply to the current times in which we live. It's not just what God can do for you. It's what God can do for us. It's not just how God can make your life good, miraculously good. It's that he can also heal the environment through us. He is not, it's not that it's God's job to now turn swords into, into plowshares. It's our job. It's not, the question is not, God, how can you let children starve? It's God's question to us. How can you let children starve? Abraham Lincoln said, nations must repent for their sins. Nations, nations must confess their sins, just as individuals must. And so, you know, yesterday, I am a Jew. I, I was at Yom Kippur services, and boy, you're called to it. And they even, you know, it's, it's fascinating, even the, the you know, the, the um, hand movement that you're meant to do and that the whole room does together. And, you know, you're really invited you're really invited, go down over this year. You know, the Catholics do it as they go along in confession. The Jews do it with Yom Kippur. Alcoholics Anonymous does it with the own mentioning of your character defects. You own your character defects. You admit them, seek to make amends. Any serious spiritual path includes the process of atonement. And you say, these are places where I went wrong. And I did do this, and I was unkind, and I did bear false witness, and I did make a mistake, and I didn't show up the way I should have in that situation, and I wasn't totally honest, and I did procrastinate, and I didn't show up for my brother and my, you just look at it. And then the beauty when you do atone is that God grants us new life. Well, America is going to simply have to start atoning for our sins in order for us to have renewal. It's not enough for the president to get up in the United Nations and talk about the extreme reign of terrorism on the part of other people. America has to be willing. It's not that we're bad people. You know, you're not bad that you've made mistakes. And a country's not bad because we've made mistakes. But ladies and gentlemen, when you look at something like this room, there's a lot of power that comes from this room. And with power comes responsibility. And we are citizens of the most powerful country on the earth. And when we get it right, 
there's nothing like the light that emanates from this country when we get it right, but it's really, really bad stuff that emanates from this country when we get it wrong. And so we want to, oh, we're adults now. We're adults in our own individual lives, and we have children. And you know, the kind of love that will save the world is not just love for your own children. It's love for children on the other side of town. It's love for children on the other side of the world. You know, when I was growing up, my mother was a housemaker, housewife. Her life centered around her children and her husband and her home. And I grew up in the phase of feminism where I thought my mother's life wasn't important enough. I wanted to go out into the world and do something more important than what I thought my mother's life was. Well, once you become a metaphysical student, you realize <laughs> there is no out there. So it took me decades to understand how wrong I was and how I viewed my mother's life. My mother was absolutely right. She felt that her place as a woman was in the home. Her place as a woman was to take care of the children. And you know what? Archetypally, what I get now, my mother was right. It's just that we have evolved to the point for women to also understand every child on this planet is one of our children and the earth itself is our home. And so some women are at, at the phase of their lives or it happens to be their personal decision that they are at home and that they are with their children and they, and then the men take the lead from that. What about the babies? What about the babies? What about the babies? When you have the second highest child poverty rate in the advanced world here in the United States, if you have the asthma rate zooming off the charts because of lack of environmental protection, we don't even have environmental protection standards in U.S. public schools. When you have so much corruption of America's food supply because of big agriculture and big, big agricultural companies, Syngenta and Dow Monsanto, that are making so much money on the food and it is literally making us ill, it is not enough that just in an individual home, the mother or the father, anyone is saying, what about the children? Let me tell you something. Anytime a law gets passed in this country, anytime any economic, social, or political policy in this country is passed, there should be an uprising of citizens saying, now tell me, what about the babies again? Tell me, how does that affect the children? How does that affect the children? But you know why that darkness is able to be perpetrated in this country? All of that multinational corporate takeover of the U.S. government, turning democracy itself into this kind of legalized system of bribery. It's just like I know many years ago in my life, I was having all these problems in relationships. And I was like, God, why do I keep meeting men like this? Why do I keep meeting men like this? And it was like the heaven, a voice booming from heaven saying, I don't know, you never seem to mind. There is nothing in your behavior that is said, I don't take this. <laughs> when you own your yes and own your no, the universe goes, woo, whoa. And that's why so much darkness, whether it's in our own lives or our own country or our planet, is able to just saunter its way, sauntering its way into your house answering all kinds of destructive behavior. Well, you didn't pray this morning, you didn't meditate this morning, you didn't fill your house with light, so why are you surprised that darkness has set in? If you didn't pray this morning and you didn't meditate this morning, you didn't download light, the absence of light is darkness. And you don't get rid of darkness by hitting it with a baseball bat, you get rid of darkness by turning on the light. That's what we need to do. Remember who you are the way Tim was talking about. Remember these things, be still and know. The Course in Miracles says five minutes spent with the Holy Spirit in the morning is enough to guarantee he will be in charge of your thought forms throughout the day. That's how much power we have. That's how much power we have through prayer, through meditation, whatever your path is. And then the practice of the Sabbath. So what have we gone through? We've gone through the fact that every day I will sit with God. Every day I will sit with God. Whatever my path is, I will read, I will pray, I will meditate, whatever my path is. And if you don't know what your path is and you ask in your heart right now, books will fall at your feet within three days. You're living in New York City. It's like a candy store, right? And you have this place and you have other ways that you can seek it. So we've talked about filling ourselves up on an individual basis, claiming the light, claiming the light. When Jesus says in the New Testament, you can build your house on rock or you can build your house on sand. Build your house on sand, the winds will come, the rains will come, and your house will fall down. You build your house on rock, the winds will come and the rains will come and your house will remain firm. What does it mean to build our house on sand? Well, circumstances. If this goes well, I'm happy. If that doesn't go well, I'm sad. 
If I get this in the world, I'm happy. If I don't get that, I'm sad. That's what it means to build our house on sand. That's because we only see ourselves as physical beings. And we see ourselves as separate from other people and in competition with other people and having to fight for the limited resources. And the Course in Miracles says you are heir to the laws that rule the world you identify with. So if you only identify with the mortal world, then these are scary times and they're getting scarier. But enlightenment is that shift from body identification to spirit identification. And that's when you look at the world, you're not in denial, you're in transcendence. You're not in negative denial. You're not looking at the world and all the bad things and choosing to look away. No, you're in positive denial. You deny their power over you given how much power you know is inside you. And so, yeah, it's time for us to say, yeah, we're grown-ups. We're not looking away. We're looking at it. But we know that we will do anything to keep our children safe in our house. And now it's time to keep our children safe in our country and to keep our planet safe.